I was at the super meet at NAB 2011 when Apple announced Final Cut Pro 10. I was one of the vendors in the tabletop area just outside the doorway to the theater. My booth was literally the last booth right before you went into the Apple section. So as the line gathered, there are photos of us doing our demos with literally hundreds and hundreds of people just waiting in line. I actually was the guy who lifted the ropes to let the crowd into that famous meeting. <laughs> and it was the most amazing thing because people ran to get seats. They're all crazy. Even the security guards were shouting like, stop running, walk, please walk. Everyone knew something was gonna be announced that night. There was so much anticipation. The presentation starts. It was surreal. Everybody's cheering, everybody's clapping, everybody's happy. This was a really exciting event because they'd completely re-engineered Final Cut from the ground up, made it 64-bit. They brought it into what I feel is the modern era. Everybody was really excited about it. And uh, Randy Ubilos, the creator of Final Cut Pro 7 and all the previous came up there and he, he demoed it. People were freaking out. They thought it was great. We'll start out on the organization. All I do is wave the cursor across the frames. I can just double click on the edit here. You know, all sorts of different metadata that I can choose to show. Things move around, but the audio that's associated with that clip moves with it. We saw some cool things. We saw some things that we didn't understand, and we saw some things that we thought, okay, maybe this will make sense at a later time. When they did the demo of dragging out an audio clip and it knocking another audio clip out of the way. You can slide a clip down to the timeline, things move out of the way. I was like, wow. It's got a magnetic timeline, and people are still cheering, and I'm like, wait a minute. No, this isn't what I want. What are you doing? And I can remember especially when they announced the price. So we decided to make it available for the amazing price. There was just this gasp that went throughout the crowd as some people were thrilled about the new price and other people were horrified by it. So I'm in the back of the room at NAB and I'm watching some interesting looks from people's faces. Some are rah-rah, that Apple fanboyism at its finest. Some people were confused. Some people were cheering because they think that Apple had really made a misstep. So I go to sleep that night. I wake up the next morning. I go online to my normal sources, and everybody is just angry as hell. <laughs> what happened? It was mutiny. And you know, it's iMovie Pro, and it's, oh my god, you've destroyed editing, and everything is going to fall apart. And I was like, what the heck? There's a disconnect between what the internet chatter is and what the actual experience of people with something like a product launch is. Nobody had seen it, nobody had touched it, but everybody had an opinion about it. That is astonishing. just released a new version of their famous editing software, Final Cut Pro. But apparently it's so different from the last version of Final Cut, video and film editors all over Hollywood are having a very hard time adjusting to it. We had the launch of Final Cut 10 came out and a lot of the very loud people were the existing users who felt like, oh my God, the world's changing out from under us. You know, how can this be? And so there was a lot of bad publicity that was running around. It was an exciting time because everybody wanted to understand how this new thing worked. And there was obviously also a lot of, uh, I don't know, blowback or people being very upset because it was different. I remember seeing the video because uh, there was like a pirated video that everyone saw on the internet of this. And I was like, this is the future. And then I opened it up and I realized the future was not quite here yet. I started using Final Cut Pro 10 on the day it was released. And I did the thing everybody did, is open it up, go, oh my God, and shut it back down again. I think that my response was, what the hell? Oh God, what is this? This can be really cool, and I really hate it. Some of those foundational things as editors that we've been doing for so many years was just, here's a piece of paper, we're gonna garble it up and toss it over the shoulder, and the playbook's out, and this is what's in. You couldn't look at that software and not be stricken by how radical a departure it was from what had come before.
There was this shocking event that happened in June, which was the publication of Final Cut Pro 10 or X. I quickly looked at it and said, I can't use this. There was a better way to take off the Band-Aid, you know, that the actual way that it was done, you know, by simultaneously releasing a product that we couldn't use professionally and end of lifing the product that we were using sent a kind of a stick in the eye message. It was a disaster at every possible level of the word disaster. Editors were not ready, Apple was not ready, the tool was not ready. Final Cut 10 didn't really become usable until the seven months after the release. Apple didn't help themselves by saying, we're no longer supporting Final Cut 7. We're, we're doing a hard cut from Final Cut 7 to Final Cut 10, and they probably should have done a dissolve. I had a little bit different idea about the way we should have gone about the transition. I thought there should have been an overlap between 7 and 10. My idea was for every copy of 10 you bought, you should get a free copy of 7. And that would be a way to sort of push it in. It's not the Apple way of doing things. The Apple way is feet first, and it certainly made a big splash. Apple presented us with a cliff. On one side of the cliff was Final Cut Pro 7. On the other side of the cliff was Final Cut Pro 10. You got to the edge, uh-oh, either you got to jump over or you have to stay. If you look at the big transitions that Apple has done in the past, they've run them in parallel. They've said, we're here, you're there, we want you to move over at your leisure. With the launch of Final Cut Pro 10, they lost a million users overnight. Even if it's a more positive shift, it can be traumatic, you know? We burned down your old house, but we replaced it with a mansion that's twice as big. It's like, wow, awesome, I think. This is a really nice house, but you burned down my old house? Are you my friend? Are you my enemy? The main arguments that I heard a lot of people talking about was frustration about um, the lack of support for legacy, that they had built whole companies based on infrastructure that now was obsolete. There were a lot of workflows in the industry that were really tightly built on how Final Cut 7 worked and ecosystems that I could just picture falling apart completely or needing to be rethought or perhaps no longer needing to exist. They invested a lot of money, a lot of their time and energy into this thing and Apple just said, sorry, we're changing and you can't buy Final Cut 7 anymore or 6 anymore. And I did feel that many people I don't know, took that more seriously than it really, it really had any effect on them in the short term. It's, it's people like you and Greg and I, I mean, they announced a new Final Cut and our sales dropped overnight. Half our income yeah. just goes away. Not right. many people can lose half their income overnight and not feel the effect. When 10 was announced, but before it was released, that sort of created an uncertainty. People stopped buying Final Cut 7 stuff, thinking, well, why would I buy something when I'm going to go to something better? So frankly, if there's anyone that's got a reason to have hated the launch of Final Cut Pro 10, it's us, because it hit us in the pocket immediately after it was shown at NAB. But we got over it and weren't afford uh, and supported Final Cut Pro 10 because of what it is, not because we hated the way it was launched. I find it interesting that so many people stepped completely away from Final Cut as a system when Final Cut 10 came out. And I think a lot of it is that people are scared of change. I think they found it personally threatening because they didn't actually know what they were. And if you're a storyteller, it doesn't matter what kind of software you use. People defined themselves as editors second and tool users first. It's not how you do it, whether you're patching tracks or making clip connections. None of those things are actually editing. Those are the functions of the editing software you're using. It's the editors who just get by on their technical ability. They're the ones who are afraid because their entire professional job is to push buttons. But the people who know the craft of editing, it's just learning another program for them. The pushback was more of an emotional reaction. It was really a more visceral, I don't want to learn something else. Why did you create this thing for me? Without actually taking the proper time to look, well, what is this thing about? I know there were some people that shifted off to other platforms, but I also saw a lot of people seeing the potential and seeing what it could do. My reaction was completely different than others. I remember the internet was crazy about it, but I, I saw a new interface and actually I liked it. I couldn't let go of the thought that 
there must be something to this program. I saw a brand new way of editing, and that's what excited me. The reason that I dove into Final Cut Pro 10.0 originally was that for everything I didn't have, I had five things that were amazing that I never had had before that I loved. Even if at the time of the launch there were things missing, we knew that it was going to move forward. I didn't understand what people were complaining about because I missed the brouhaha. And when I started to work on it, it was pretty solid. I remember it coming out and there being this big kerfuffle. It wasn't bad press. It actually had turned into good press for me because I'm like, okay, this is actually, they've done something so huge here that it's pissing a lot of people off, so I'm automatically interested. After 10 was launched and all the, uh, you know, people started writing and saying, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that, Apple had made a huge mistake. Steve Jobs phoned Randy up. I was actually at home and get a call and it's, please hold for Steve Jobs. I was like, oh, okay, what's going on? And it was Steve asking, you know, what's going on here? What's the deal? And I told him that we knew there were gonna be people that were gonna be upset. We should have had a better plan for the transition for the Final Cut 7 people because they had pulled Final Cut 7. And he said, we need to get them back on the market immediately so people can buy Final Cut 7. And one of the things he said at the very end uh, it was actually my last conversation ever with Steve, and he said, so do you believe in this, in what we're doing, with the software? And I said, yes, and he said, then I do too. And that was kind of Steve's way of, you know, if, if we believe in what we're doing, you know, we're gonna get through this, you're not gonna like just let a bunch of people ranting about something change your minds. We believe in this, this is what we're gonna do. The Super Meat launched Final Cut Pro 10 in London about two years ago, and it is time to take a closer look. Every single one of us hates change. I would love to say I adopt change with open arms. I'm dragged kicking and screaming against my will into the new subject. I just want everything to stay the same. Probably the smartest man I've met is Michael Cioni, and he had a great quote. He said, behavioral changes are more important than technical ones. And if I hear one comment coming back in the 300 emails that I get a day, behavioral changes are at the heart of it. Why did Apple have to change this? People sometimes wonder, why did Final Cut go to 10 and not just build eight? When you look at Final Cut 7, you're seeing a fully mature piece of software that does what everybody wants it to do, but really has a lot of inherent limitations under the hood. There was a lot of old code in the classic Final Cut Pro that didn't take advantage of all the hardware. There were a lot of limitations. So many things are changing that then applications must also change with the time. If you think about it in terms of remodeling a house, what's the point at which it's more effective to just tear down the house and build a new one versus kind of bolt things on and try and make that house like live up to codes and things that you know a city has implemented. I think it was a very influential thing when Apple said we are not going to move carbon forward into 64-bit. So there goes not just the editing application but the entire media framework that it's based on. Both of them gone. Apple had a major problem with Final Cut 7. They were going to have to rewrite huge sections of this tool. If you're going to take the time to rewrite code from scratch because you're doing 64-bit, you might as well change some of the functionality of the application. Here was a group of people that were willing to take risks on pretty much every level and essentially start over after they had really conquered quite a bit of territory. For Apple to kill Seven was that absolutely, that's what you gotta do. You just gotta kill your darlings. And it was a good run, but it was old and inferior. The world was moving away from videotape, was moving away from film, and moving entirely into a digital environment. I love that they said, let's reinvent. Let's look at where things are going with digital media, and let's reinvent the editing paradigm based on where we think things are going. And in doing so, clearly they had left certain features behind, and I think that people really focused on that. People really should have maybe been paying attention, but for some reason, a whole lot of people got really emotional, and um, 
just swore a lot and didn't look back, which is a big shame because the new ideas that Final Cut 10 brought to editing are really valuable. A company doesn't do that unless there's a big thought behind it. The saying is you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs and you can't have improvement without some level of disruption. I think people want everything to get better but never change. And anybody who thinks about that for five minutes will realise that that's a nonsense. Things must change in order to improve. If you had asked Henry Ford, what did people really want? He probably would have said they wanted a faster horse. But instead of making a faster horse, he made the car, right? The automobile. Now, if you get in a, an early Ford and you had sat there and taken leather reins and thought that you could go like this and it would make the car go faster and pull them back and make the car stop and pull them to one side or the other and make the car turn, that sounds ridiculous because we have the steering wheel and we have the gas and the brake. The metaphor changes and the user interface changes too. It is weird what the magnetic timeline does until you get the right metaphor for it. If you get the wrong metaphor, it feels like it's doing things behind your back and confusing you and being smarter than you are. If you're an experienced editor, uh, the magnetic timeline can be a real battle to overcome the understanding. Because everything you know from previous NLE experience doesn't benefit you when you're trying to use the magnetic timeline. People know how Final Cut 7 or Media Composer um, and now Premiere work. They all work pretty much the same way. So there's not a huge learning curve. I could go from here to here and be okay, and from here to here and be okay, and then from 7 to Final Cut 10, I'm like, why don't I understand this? For an editor who is involved in a, in a very complicated project, and they've learned that language and they're really comfortable with it, right? They don't have to take their hands off the keyboard. All of a sudden, a new language comes in, a new interface comes in. You have to relearn everything that you used to know. It doesn't take that long, but stopping in the middle of something is, is frightening. I don't begrudge people who say the timeline just doesn't work for them, they can't work out, because when you use it to begin with, it's like driving a car and the things are all in the wrong place, or you try and turn left and actually goes right. You know, they inverted the whole, when you delete a clip, it ripples. That's an inversion of every other NLE. What we needed to do is at least be confident as designers that we were building metaphors that actually existed in the world. So if you had all your clips is a bunch of little kids' blocks sitting on a platform. Then when you pull one of the blocks out, then everything would collapse up, except no, I'm wrong. If, if you did have all of a bunch of kids' blocks sitting there on a platform, you pull one out, they wouldn't close up. And this was exactly the problem. So what we did was we took this concept of the, the blocks on a platform and we put it at an angle. And when you put the blocks at an angle and you take one of the blocks away, they do close up because of gravity. You know, the magnetic timeline was very disorienting for about 10 minutes. And then you realize how brilliant it is. Then you suddenly get it. And once you pass that point, it's fine. It's a cliche, but there is like an, oh, OK, now all this makes sense. And then once you cross that Rubicon, you, there's, there's no going back. My brain was very much not into it. So when I, uh, I actually I started meditating, not on that in particular, but just someone said that was a good idea. And after I did, I was like, I need to take another look at this software. And so I did without prejudice. And uh, I ended up almost immediately sort of seeing the value in it. The paradigm of cutting in Final Cut is the way I intuitively think about it. Where other NLEs, I'm thinking about how to make an edit. Everything kind of up through Final Cut 7 and some of the other, a bunch of the other systems that are out there were really all based on the tape metaphor, source, record. 
and very much individual tracks that are all separate, completely independent. And as people would work on a project, it became much easier to mess it up when you change something. If you had a you know, hour-long project, people didn't want to do anything at the beginning of the project because it would change something 20 minutes downstream or 10 minutes downstream that you wouldn't know that it was going to mess up. You'd have to run down and verify that everything stayed in place. And so things just felt fragile. And that was because there were a lot of relationships between the items in the timeline that were in the editor's head. The software didn't know those relationships. They were just, oh, you put two clips next to each other in the timeline. Why did you put them there? Is there a particular spot in this piece of audio that's supposed to line up with this spot in this piece of video? You line them up a particular way, but why? And a big part of Final Cut 10 was trying to get rid of those boundaries and those barriers and just make the editing be much more about the content and the result. When you look at it to start off with, you, you, know, you think, why have they abandoned tracks? But what they've done is actually invent a better way of editing. Everything is connected to each other, so audio is connected at a certain point in the timeline. It's kind of like an assistant editor. It frees you from dealing with uh, tracks and dealing with uh, whether you're in sync or not. It's quicker for me to do a change for a director and argue myself out of doing that change because I'm coming up with a reason why I don't think it's going to work. I don't have to sit there and worry about if a producer wants me to alter something because I know I can just pick something up and drag it. It's very simple to do. Grab a clip, move it, everything moves with it, timeline closes up, opens up where the new clip is going. I kind of really embrace that new paradigm. The idea that, you know, we have clips, we don't have film, we don't have tape. So why do we need tracks, right? The other editors are kind of uh, linear, and I believe it's for a reason. I believe they are not so good at handling nonlinear operations, and they try to cover that. They try to show you first, uh, you know, the linear tools, because the other tools don't work so well in a track-based paradigm. What happens if you want to change the order of this shot? All right, so. You know, let's try to move it with the default selection tool. See what happens. See? Nothing moves. You leave a gap and you overwrite stuff. What could I do in Premiere? Of course, use a modifier tool to reverse the default behavior. Okay? So I'm just going to press Command here while I drag the shot. And you see, this is Premiere warning me something's going to happen here. <laughs> Be careful, you know, I'm not so good at handling nonlinear operations, okay? So, yeah, uh, let's try to do that and see what happens. This is a mess, right? <laughs> I have a gap here, I have two gaps here, my whole music track is broken in half, I have another gap here, and I have to fix this mess. Let me show you how simple is this in, in Final Cut. Here I have the same shot. It's overlapping the audio, it's a split edit as well. And I'm just going to shop. swap the shot, and that's it. That's how easy it is to just uh, make a change in your sequence. I've heard good user interface design described as make the simple things easy and the hard things possible. Apple has done an, a tremendous job of keeping the interface simple. You can't mistake simplicity for lack of power. Editing itself is hard enough. Uh, I don't want to screw around with complicated software. One definition of professional software is it's really hard to use, so that means you have to put lots of work into learning it, which means you can charge lots of dollars per day for doing it. It's a little bit of a gatekeeper concept where you've got very difficult to use professional applications that only a few people can really figure out. Final Cut's a bit different because it's so accessible to new users. And I think that's what Apple's going for. I think that they wanted some software that a new user could pick it up and not be scared by. We were in Barcelona, uh, Blanquerna School, and they only teach Final Cut Pro 10, nothing else. So I asked the, the manager, I said, why on earth are you doing this? He said, Final Cut Pro 10 is the easiest NLE to learn, to get familiar with. And so that gives us much more time to teach them editing. And once they're editors, they can learn any NLE. We've been able to teach producers that we're working with on the road, or just teach other people how to cut and to edit. And as soon as you share this knowledge, all you end up doing is basically growing your team. It is very easy to learn 
how to do simple editing in Final Cut 10. On the other hand, for more experienced editors who need the complexity, Final Cut 10 also has that in it. The best thing in Final Cut Pro 10 is performance and stability. And coming from a broadcast background, that is all we need. If you don't have a feature that you need, you probably can find a workaround. But if you don't have the performance, you can't really work at all. By the way, is anybody in the room using Final Cut 10? I mean, is, is there some animosity with anybody? Yeah. yeah. OK. No, I, listen, I want to be very open about this. I'm sad that people hate Final Cut 10, and I'm sad that the people who love Final Cut 10 feel like they're oppressed. I just want us all to get over it. I think the animosity towards Final Cut 10 by now is unfounded. I mean, it's such a professional app, it's so powerful, that people who today say that it's not good just haven't given it a chance, they haven't learned it. There's sort of a stigma that's still attached to it, which I find sort of ironic when you think how Final Cut, to begin with, really changed a lot of the post-production industry. I started calling all my friends and said, do you know Final Cut Pro 10? Are you using it? And then I found out that there was so much misinformation about this application. And I said, we're using it on, on really high-end jobs. I know have friends who use it on feature films. How can you tell me that this is not a professional application? Now, it's clearly been demonstrated that Final Cut Pro X can be used on feature films. The fact that that is news is because 98% of feature films are still to this day cut on Media Composer, partly because of the comfort of entrenched workflows, partly because Avid supports that studio system. It's harder to get it into places which are well established because studios do not like uncertainty. And that's why they go with what works and what has worked. Right now in Los Angeles, you have to speak Avid if you want to work professionally on all of the big Hollywood movies. The vast, vast, vast majority of things are still cut on Avid for lots and lots of reasons that are all about not changing something that already works and not about saving money. It's the people that get kind of mired down in what I like to call the machine. Well, well everybody, you know, everybody in the film, in the you know, reality TV uses Avid, so I have to use Avid. I don't care if Hollywood uses Final Cut Pro 10 or not. We use Final Cut Pro 10 every day successfully. Here at Metronome, we've cut more than 50 seasons of various TV shows all cut in Final Cut 10 during the past five years. We are 200 people working at a huge organization. We have many, many editors. We have many, many pre-editors. We have journalists, and they are all connected to a central server. When we began editing in Final Cut 10, we had to find a way to work together in a server environment. You can exchange your sequences using transfer libraries or XML or use Keyflow Pro as an intermediate drag and dropping between the users. So we collaborate all the time. And many people tend to think that if Final Cut Pro 10 doesn't do the exact same thing as Avid does, then it's not suitable for professional work. In the pro world, you can't tell how good something is unless you find out what it's been used for previously, be it a piece of equipment, a person, or some software. And it, all it takes is the right person, or from other people's perspective, the wrong person to use Final Cut Pro 10, and then everyone will have permission to use it. If nothing changes, if you don't change anything, you can count on having a default future, a predictable very, very simple, predictable future. And that's not what the people on Focus are interested in. That's not what I'm interested in, and my close friends are not interested in default futures. Some filmmakers love to be the guinea pigs because they feel like they're walking in new territory, and that can be creatively inspiring. Other filmmakers want control, and they want to be able to predict it all. And I can't say one is better than the other, but I can say which one I identify with more, and I certainly identify with the people that are not settling for what is expected. John and I, my partner, we, uh, we decided we were gonna do our next movie digitally. I was looking into Final Cut, I just got really interested in it, and I just wondered, well, can somebody, can you do this? The internet said, no, you can't make a movie, which immediately made me think, oh, sure you can. 
John Requa and Glenn Fricara are two great examples of filmmakers who are basically saying, how can we push the walls of creative control back? At the time, we were very lucky. John and I were in really good standing with Warner Brothers. We put out there, I think, you know, we want to use Final Cut. And they went, okay. We've done plenty of movies on Final Cut. And it kind of bit my lip and said, okay, let's just leave it there for now. And uh, <laughs> let's get our test going. You are kind of trying to find out what's possible and you'll be able to edit on Final Cut Pro 10 in studio environment. Mike Matzdorf was around and he was very instrumental in selling it to the studio. And he took them through it and he said, this is stem to stern, how it's going to work. We were able to just find out what worked, find out what didn't work and what needed to be different. And you have to, you have to stress test things if you want to prove them out. We were able to like lay down a trail of breadcrumbs, as it were, for people in the future. And with Jan's help, who was willing to take on the risk and the uh, pressure of being able to deliver a product that was better and faster and more collaborative at higher qualities, that was something that you have to have the right mindset to do. Since we were shooting digitally, it seemed like a natural choice to kind of move the post-production world kind of into the future. Jan was in the trailer nearby as we're shooting, so we would pop in there, either go over dailies with him or he would just slop assemblies together. I mean, I think a lot of editors are saying, we don't know if we're ready for that, if we want the directors to be able to do that, and other people are saying, oh, this would be really exciting if we had that type of uh, collaboration. Editing is the only department that gets the movie for two weeks after you wrap and they get to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And then you go through this six-week process of breaking it down, building it back up, and it's better to go on that journey together. You save so much more time. There's an expectation of what you think is possible, but if you're really innovative, you create more than that, and you go further than you thought, and then you get hungrier, and you start building your own tools that make the process better for you. When we started Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, we had bigger ideas. One of the big changes we did was uh, deciding to carry original negative on our sand. We were cutting in original native resolution, being our own lab, not getting charged to pull each shot and send it to the visual effects company. Our artists were just down the hall, so my editor could hand me a shot that he wanted to send to VFX, and we could sometimes have that shot back the same day. Mike Cioni at Light Iron is fantastic. Even though this is taking money out of his pocket, he was down with this idea. What was really cool about Whiskey Tango Foxtrot is that the files that they were actually editing with were higher quality than I would say any other motion picture at the time. Final Cut being resolution independent allowed us to work in very, very high resolution 2K footage. We're looking at the camera original quality and pixel for pixel what it's gonna be on the final 80 foot screen at every theater in America. Other directory friends that I brought in for notes and things like that just, you know, I'd say, why does your movie look so good, you know? <laughs> When they're screening it for all these test screenings, it looks like we did a whole online. And they did the whole, on and they did. They just did it themselves for free with a button. And those are the things that Final Cut does do better, but those are the things that are hard to demonstrate. And so a lot of cutting rooms are missing out. But if you told editors and they understood that you could be editing with Hero Media, log access, without having to de-log it yourself, without any time penalties, would you do it? There's a sense of, oh, this is the way it is, and this is the way it always will be. But that isn't really how film in general has been. We're, we're an industry of technology, and we're an industry of thinkers. We were at a time when we did Focus where Post was kind of topping out. Uh, it was like, well, well, this is kind of the way we do things, and we don't need to kind of do it any differently. And it, it just it seemed wrongheaded. The reason Hollywood hasn't switched over to Final Cut 10 is because they don't care because they don't have to worry about money. It's a fraction of what they pay their A-list actor. If you are an independent filmmaker, it is probably the largest part of your budget. So the process with which you create your movie has to be almost perfect if you want to have any hope of monetizing your movie and getting to make another one. They're going to be slow to change because they've got stuff that works 
stuff that wins awards, stuff that puts stuff on the air, and they're not going to want to change because there's no motivation for them to change. They'll just say, well, this is how we do it here. You want to work here? And one day, they will find that the people who are making the great stuff, because great stuff comes from young minds, will be saying, F you. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to put it out on YouTube. And we're going we're gonna to have a million people viewing it. We're going to be making more revenue from that. And if you don't like it, that's just too bad. It's really cool to get people into editing by saying this, you use the same software that's been used to make feature films. That worked in the, 10 years ago. Now, the task to create a video is different in our lives. Everybody really does have access to world fame and world notoriety, and they don't have to pay their dues going up through the hierarchy of a business or through an industry industrial process. Their picture at any moment could be taken from the internet or their video could be taken from the internet and it could be put on a big billboard. That is how people see the internet and their own position in it right now. There's no paying dues. So the idea of Final Cut Pro use it because it's been used by pros is irrelevant. Now Final Cut Pro use it because it's really easy to get your story out, whatever that is, and then people will trust your story as the one that needs to be shared with the world, and then you can change the world with it. Has it changed the definition of professional? Yes. Has it changed the market? Totally. Made it much broader. And this often threatens people who have spent years learning a craft because they've spent years learning a craft and now some 20-year-old has got 750 million followers on YouTube and generating a billion dollars a year in revenue and they're not part of the priesthood. They're totally separate from it. I do personally really enjoy the idea of me and John and Glenn working on a big feature on exactly the same software that a kid is using, cutting his own first video and uploading it somewhere. We see it being adopted very quickly by the next generation coming up who are using video literacy as frequently and as commonly, or probably more so, than writing. I have a daughter and, you know, for her generation, communication isn't about writing essays. It isn't even necessarily about photography. It's about sharing experiences through video. It's day-to-day -day currency for millions and millions of people. It's an impulse that people just decide to create a video and send it without thinking about it. And then they may start thinking about it. When they start thinking about it, they'll start thinking about how to tell stories. Throw leaves up in the air. Keep doing it. Stop. People are going to start getting together and realizing that filmmaking and movie making is actually not something that only studios can do, but it's something that's actually like a recreational thing. You're gonna make movies with your friends and family and you're gonna share them with the rest of your friends and have a good time and like have a barbecue in your backyard. I think that that was the, the goal of Final Cut 10 was to, to grow the market. Final Cut Classic opened that market unexpectedly. Andrew Baum, who was the product manager of Final Cut when it was launched, said, we expect to sell 20 to 25,000 units in the first two years. I believe they sold 120,000 in that period and started to really look at video seriously and realize that, no, this wasn't a tool for Abbott's market. This was a tool for the entire world. And it's the democratization of video. I think what Apple did with desktop publishing, they're trying to do with video. We think desktop video is going to be the next big thing. Imagine this in classrooms. Imagine classroom video reports. Imagine this with parents. Imagine the Steven Spielbergs of the world being able to use this technology when they're kids. It's going to be unbelievable. The skill of storytelling using video is becoming something that everybody needs to be able to do. You are not going to graduate from high school now without making a movie. Visual literacy is part of what we need to teach. Even if you don't become a filmmaker, you need to know what goes into making a film because films will manipulate you uh, through the media if you don't know what's happening with them. It is expected that you will make video as part of your job, and that is going to be the sort of thing that the next generation grows up with. That'll be just what they do. Video production won't be special. 
Doesn't mean there won't be people who are still making great film, great television. But what it means is that if I have a great idea and I have a few friends, we can probably make something without having to wait 10 years to get together a $700,000 budget to make our short feature. Final Cut Pro 10 allows you to fail cheaper. You can fail for a fraction of the cost and make your first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, fiftieth movie for what it costs me to make my first one. I strongly disagree with the previous state of the industry where only people who have access to a lot of money can actually learn how to make movies. That's not fair. Today, you have very little excuse not to make a film if you really want to make a film because you don't have to buy the film. You don't have to process the film. You don't have to transfer the film to videotape. You don't have to have negative cut. When the printing press was invented, the, the church wasn't so happy in general because suddenly they couldn't control the message. And we fast forward and the word processor becomes ubiquitous. Laser printers become ubiquitous. I can do desktop publishing. How many Hemingways are there out there? But suddenly, there's no longer the excuse, I don't own the typewriter, I don't own the pen, I don't own the tools. I have a phone in my pocket that I, as a filmmaker in film school, would have killed to have a picture of this sort of quality. You can shoot video on your phone. You can even rough it together in iMovie on your phone. And if you're really smart, you could push it off to Final Cut from there. How many times as a creative do you have a story in your head? And then what has happened in the past is, okay, it's a great idea, but there's no way of making it come true. There's no way of making it happen. And now there's no excuse. You don't have an excuse. If you're a creative person and you want to tell a story, you have everything it takes to tell a story. So if you don't do it, it's your fault. With video, I can tell stories, influence people, and connect with others on a whole new level. I get a lot of inquiries from people wanting me to do small to large projects for them. I have two buttons that control certain actions and commands when hooked up to my Mac. The accessibility works really well with Final Cut Pro because it is the same operating system so I don't get glitches. While editing the video I am using my keyboard for Final Cut Pro X. The first thing that I do, look at every video and pick my shots, and then start my editing process. Second thing that I do, put in any transitions, titles and or effects. After that, I start with the sound, make sure the levels are good. During this process, I am watching the film over, over and over again. Switch Control has made such an impact in my life. It has given me the opportunity to express myself both personally and professionally. It has helped break down barriers and allows people to see the real me and to see my true talents. Randy Ubelos, he gave us a tool for the common man that is it's vital for our future. The mechanics of editing have kind of gone away, and it really now comes down to storytelling. Making it easier for somebody to tell a story means that someone's more likely to do it. If they have a story and they can tell it easily, that means we get to see more of those stories, which I think is really cool. It happens in a largely unclean way a lot of times. Often the most significant changes don't work at all in the beginning. It is very easy to dismiss powerful ideas at the beginning because they are not yet fully formed. But this is no longer where we are 
I think it is extremely clear that this platform is continuing to innovate. I think probably the best thing that ever happened to Final Cut 10 was that launch. Because everyone abandoned ship. Everyone said, you know what, this is unprofessional, Apple's dead, you know, it's never gonna happen. And then what ended up happening, all of the th things that tie Avid down and all of these other applications, well, that was completely freed up on the Final Cut side. They could do whatever they want because none of the professional community cared anymore. I love that Apple's infrastructure is so forward thinking and that they're willing to start over. I think that was very brave. I think that there's a better way to do everything and hindsight being 2020, you could play this out 20 different ways. But I don't think it changes what the product is. The product we have today is an awesome product. Whether or not the marketing was good or bad, whether or not it targeted the right people or the wrong people, the product stands on its own two feet. And I'm really, really glad that it's out there. You know, Randy, along with his team, have invented all of this stuff. It's amazing. The time that I had at Apple was, I look back and I feel very fortunate to have been there in the time period that I, that I was there, where software was a big component of things that were going on at Apple. And I just love hearing all of the people's lives I've gotten to touch indirectly through the stuff that I've gotten to work on. It's been, it's really rewarding to have gotten to do that.